if you've got your Bible, you can turn with me to 1 Peter. We're in chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, where we will be at, Lord willing, this morning. And if you don't know where 1 Peter is at, you just go to the back of your Bible, and you can uh, probably find all the Johns and the the J's together, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, John, Jude. Right in front of that is all the Peters. 1st <laughs> and 2nd Peter. We're in 1st Peter and chapter 4. So, this morning we're talking about a passage here which deals with some a subject that we aren't necessarily fond of as often, and that is being persecuted for the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the passage here, Peter, encourages us that if we follow Jesus, then we're going to be persecuted. And when we follow Jesus in persecution, then it lets everybody know around us that we've made a clean break with our old life of sin. We're done with the flesh. We're done with what's comfortable. And we're okay with being persecuted for Christ. So, if you are able in honor of the reading of God's word, I invite you to stand with me as we read. And the word of God speaks to us this morning from 1 Peter 4 and says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the Spirit the way God does. Thank you. You can be seated. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this day. And God, we thank you for this, your word. We pray, God, that you would illumine our minds and our hearts uh, through this, uh, your word. And Lord, help us to see how these truths uh, written thousands of years ago apply to us today and how they are absolutely essential for the way that we live our Christian life. Lord, I do want to lift up our... Uh, uh, students and teachers as they're getting ready to get back to school again this week. May you bless them. Lord, may you allow them to represent Christ in the school system. Lord, so that uh, they might um, Lord, be, be an impact on those around them. And uh, Father God, so that they might be able to use their brains uh, and their minds to be able to, uh, to learn about this creation that you've made. And uh, Lord, to be better stewards of the talents and the gifts that you've given them. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Peter says that we need to prepare ourselves to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you prepared to suffer? Uh, it's something that is difficult for us to think about, but, but if we follow in the footsteps of the one who was crucified and the one who was mocked and the one who was spat upon, and we shouldn't be shocked and surprised when we have to suffer along with him as we follow him. Peter says, since that's what happened, since Christ suffered in the flesh, and he's talked about Christ suffering for us multiple times throughout this, uh, this book. But he says, since Christ has already gone ahead and he's already suffered in the flesh, then arm yourselves. That imagery of war, it's appropriate for this life, isn't it? Uh, this life is a battlefield. It's a battlefield over your soul. And uh, Satan is the main enemy, but he's also got a friend in your flesh, doesn't he? And so uh, we have on our side, or we have on the devil's side, it's the flesh and the world and the devil on one side, and on the other, it's God and the church and the gospel of Jesus on the other. Well, as Christians, we, we've taken up our armor. Paul has already talked about this in Ephesians chapter 6. And put on the full armor of God. Don't forget something. And let's be honest, there's one aspect that all soldiers going out to battle know they have to have, and that's a helmet. 
He says, don't forget the helmet of your salvation. Don't go out into the battlefield with your mind set on the things of this world. Go ahead and arm your bodies, that's great, but arm your minds as well. Put on that helmet of salvation. Because as we think, so we tend to act, right? We do the things we do, we sin in the, the ways that we do because of our thinking. It starts with our thinking. And so Peter says, focus on the thinking. And how do we adjust our thinking? Think about Christ. Think about Christ going to that cross. Think about him suffering for your sins. Put your name there and say, he suffered for me. He went through that for me. Therefore, I'm going to follow him. I'm going to be willing to suffer along with him. Uh, back in chapter 1, verse 13, Peter said, we must prepare our minds or gird up the loins of our minds for the hope of Christ's return. He said, get ready, guys. You're not in the promised land yet. Gird up your loins like you're going to walk through the wilderness of this life. Get your mind ready for that, for that trek, but also get your mind ready for that day when he blows that trumpet and comes back. So that's what he said back in 1.13. Well, now in 4, verse 1, he says, Prepare your minds for the suffering that you're going to have to endure as you go on that journey. Until Christ returns, the world is not going to be our friend. Now, I'm not saying that every non-Christian is going to be throwing rocks at you and spitting at you and all. We know that's not the case. I was a non-Christian, I know. I was a very nice non-Christian towards other Christians. But when it comes down to it, there is a clear dividing line. There are two ways to live, and that's why I've entitled this sermon, Two Ways to Live. One way to live is as what's been noted, the path of least resistance. The, the pathway of this world, of joining in with the world's thinking, of living in a way that, that they accept and they approve and that they're okay with. That's one way to live. And the other way to live is to live in a way that Jesus or God approves of and the world say what they want, that you're going to follow God's will well, Peter, he's concerned that these believers would realize that the one that they're following is one who suffered, and they ought to arm themselves, prepare themselves, take up their, uh, their armor in readiness for what awaits them, and that is suffering, persecution. He says the reason for this is a little bit in the end of verse 1 and into verse 2. Though this shows you're done living for the flesh. So our first point there is prepare for suffering with Christ. Prepare for suffering with Christ, for this shows you're done with living for the flesh. He says, whoever has ceased, or whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. And he had told them that as well back in one 13 when he talked about their minds and then the next verse he said those obedient children don't be conformed to those passions of your former ignorance you were ignorant you were a fool when it came to God and God's way and God's will for your life before you knew Jesus Christ and so he says the same thing here he says that was the time of your ignorance that was the past for you and you have you're done with that you have spent enough time he says in verse 3, the time that has passed suffices. And you pl you've spent plenty of time living for the flesh. Now, now think about your life before you came to know Jesus. I don't know how long you were lost. Uh, I came to the faith in Christ when I was 17. And I can tell you all some stories uh, of my lostness. And just, wow, I was so blind. And I was so dead to God. And so numb to what hurt other people and uh, just was living for the flesh, even though on the outside people would look at me and say, he's a good kid. Now, maybe uh, you're like my wife. She was converted at a very young age. She doesn't quite remember a lot of you know, those things that I remember very clearly in my old life of sin. She just, you know, remembers this and that a little bit. Well, either way, you cut the cake. Your life of sin, you spent enough time in it, right? If you spent one minute living for the flesh, living for this world, you spent enough time. The time that you've spent plenty of time living in the flesh, 
Now it's time to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're here this morning, or maybe you, you're convicted about the fact that you haven't been living right, just remember this passage, you have spent plenty of time doing what the Gentiles want to do, doing what pagans like to do, doing what this world accepts. And now is the time of salvation. Today is the day of salvation, Paul says uh, elsewhere. So you say, well, how do I do that? Well, that's the entire point of it all. Christ suffered in the flesh. Jesus Christ, he went to that cross so that you would be able to say, that you want to turn from your sins to him. And that can happen the moment you decide to do so. That's for the non-believer here this morning, for the one who's sort of been living for the world. And you say, well, I'm a believer. What is this speaking to us? Well, Peter's writing to these believers, and he's saying that when you decide to follow Jesus Christ, you're going to have enemies. We're going to have people that don't like our faith in Jesus. When, when you decide to be vocal about your faith, when you decide that you're not going to hide it under a, uh, under a bushel or under the bed, like Jesus said, that your light is going to be out there in the open. And when you put your light out in the open, and you put it up on Facebook, and you put it uh, out in your community, in your neighborhood, and you let people know, I follow Jesus, and I love Jesus, and I want you to follow Jesus too, then you're going to get enemies. Now, don't try to make enemies. You know, that's not what Jesus would want us to do. And that's not what Peter's calling for. He's just saying, you'll have them if you really want to get sold out for this uh, Jesus. And it lets people know that when they <laughs> insult you and when they persecute you and you are accepting of this, that you're, you understand this is part of following Jesus, you don't get mad and retaliate at them, like he said in last week, then it lets people know that Something has changed. Your desires to please other people and live a comfortable, nice, easy life, it's over with. Like, how is it that you don't want other people to like you? How is it that you don't, how is it that you've embraced this life of suffering? What's wrong with you? That's what they're thinking. As the ESB Study Bible puts it, the nerve center of your sin has been severed. Isn't that beautiful? Your old life of sin moment that you take up your cross and you follow Jesus Christ the world sees there's a break there's a difference you're not the same you, you're a different person Paul told Timothy, Timothy this therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord nor of me as prisoner but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God you say how am I going to do this by the power of God, for the gospel. You take up your cross, you follow Christ, you're vocal about your faith in Jesus, you're not ashamed of Jesus. Remember what Jesus said, those who are ashamed of me, of him will I and the Father be ashamed on this last day, on judgment day. In Matthew 10, Jesus told the disciples that. You see, it lets people know that when you're sold out for Jesus, you're willing to be persecuted for Christ, that you understand that's just part of what it means to be following Christ. They see there's a break with sin. You're done with that old life of the flesh. And also, um, we got to prepare to suffer for the Lord, or for the world, rather. The world despises those who aren't going to join in with them. Any of you all heard of um, John Bunyan's book, The Pilgrim's Progress? It used to be the number one most sold English book of all time. I think for like 300 years and the reason was because this this guy John Bunyan he was persecuted for his faith in Jesus he was a gospel preacher and one night in his jail cell for preaching Christ he had a dream and in this dream he dreamed of a Christian that was traveling to the celestial city and, and all the different temptations and the, the struggles that this this individual named Christian had to face and and uh, but he finally made it through all those t temptations and tribulations, he finally made it. And so he gets up and he starts writing <clears throat> this story. And of course, he adds a lot to it and makes it just this uh, the story of the Christian life. But in the story, he has a Christian with a friend named Faithful. And as they're traveling towards a celestial city, they come to a big town of great temptation. And it was Vanity Fair. And as Christian and Faithful come into Vanity Fair, they've got everything the world could ever offer them. They've got pleasures and trinkets and treasures and you name it, they've got it and it's at their disposal. It's kind of like what we have today. The world is at our fingertips. 
you want it, the world is going to give it to you. It's available for you. If you if any, if you have within you this desire for something, the world says we can we can satisfy that. We'll just give you more drink, or we'll give you some things to look at that are inappropriate. We'll, we'll, whatever you want, we'll give it to you. And as Christian and uh, faithful come into this town, they said, uh, "Well, here's all that we offer." And they said, we don't want that stuff. We want love. We want truth. We want grace. We want mercy. And the people said, what's wrong with y'all? We don't have that stuff. And if we don't have it, then you don't want it. And if you want it, then you're weird. And so they started persecuting them. They started beating them up. And they threw one in jail. Uh, they threw them both in jail. One ended up getting killed in the story. But, but the point of that is, that is how it's going to be in this life. You see, if you don't join them, they'll malign you. They'll malign you because you're not celebrating what they celebrate. They'll, they'll insult you. And as we think about our old life of sin, it ought to make us realize, you know, whatever they have to offer us, I've already tasted every single last drop of it, and it's not worth a penny. What about y'all? I've talked to believers who've done every sin on the planet. You could just imagine it. They've done it. And never a one has told me, that really satisfied. I'm so glad that I did that. I'm so glad that I lived all those years in that drunken state. I'm so glad that I that I acted on my selfish anger and rage and I, I killed that other person. Nobody would say that. When they follow Jesus, they say, man, what a wasted time. Why did I spend my life that way? Calvin writes this in his commentary, the memory of our past life ought to stimulate us to repentance and doubtless it ought to be the sharpest goad to make us run on well when we recollect that We've been wandering from the right way the greatest part of our life. Satan has had enough of you. He's had enough of your service. The flesh has had enough of everything you can offer it. How about let's give everything to God? Let's give Jesus 110%. Let's spend the rest of our days saying, I'm going to be a Christian everywhere I go. I'm going to follow Christ Jesus no matter what happens. And the world is going to despise us. We know that because we don't live for what they love. Verse 3, the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. There's a connection there. The will of God, the want of God, and then the want and will of the pagans around you. All of us are going to fall into one of those two categories. Either we're going to do what God wants, or we're going to do what the world or the flesh wants. There's just only two ways to live. That's it. At the end of the day. There's going to be sheep, and there's going to be goats. There's going to be heaven, and there's going to be hell. There is a giant dividing line between all of humanity, and if you're here this morning, you're on one side or the other, and you have a choice to either live for one or live for the other. That's it. It's black and white. There is no gray matter with God. Now, you know, you say, well, this and that issue, you know. In God's mind, it is black and white. It's as clear as crystal. So he says there that there is a list of things that are apparent in the world that you can look at and you can say, yeah, that's, that's what the world wants. That's what the pagans want to do. He lists them out as sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless idolatry. Now, maybe you look at that list and you say, well, I've never done any of those things. Well, Peter's not giving us an exhaustive list just as all the other lists that are found in the scripture, you know, of of that which is worthy of hell. It's not an exhaustive list. It's just a list of such things. In other words, I know of says, and things like these, which means there's a lot more I could add to the list, but here's just an example. As a matter of fact, in you and in me, every person here is the seed of every sin that is on this planet. Seed form of murder, you know what? You just push your buttons hard enough. You just get around enough influences. You, you get tempted hard enough, and you'll do it. Don't tell me you won't. Because if you know your flesh, then you know, in me, as Paul says, nothing good dwells. Nothing good dwells in this flesh right here. So he says, this is the kind of thing that the world is about. And Peter goes to describe it, and he says, Look at all the just the horror, the, the, the ugliness of sin. This is, this is what this world has to offer you. You want to live for that? You want to end up there? That's, that's what it's going to look like. Now, I look at the list. I've never been in a drinking party. I've never gotten drunk before. But, you know, 
that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm off the hook. The seed of that sin is in my heart. I could, if I was pushed to the to the moment, could could sin in that way as well. And it doesn't matter if you're here this morning and you say I've done those things. It, there's grace in Christ for every single sin. The only sin, Jesus said, the only sin for which there's no forgiveness is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is to reject the Spirit's work in your life. Say, I don't want, want Jesus. To not come to Him. Well, there's two paths. And uh, as one commentator puts it, Peter's readers face the choice of either taking that path of least resistance, going along with the values, norms, practices of the world, or obeying God and suffering ostracism and judgment from family and friends, those who criticize and condemn them. You see, when you decide to follow Jesus, you strap a target on your chest. Watch what happens when you get serious about your faith in Christ. Watch what happens. I guarantee you, somebody's going to find you and say or think something bad about you. <clears throat> Those who engaged in that particular sinful way that you once did, they're going to be first confused by the change of heart that they see in you, and then they're going to be moved from confusion to uh, despising you in their heart. And that is one surefire way to lose some friends is to have a friend in God and be committed to following His will. One surefire way to gain enemies is to give yourself wholeheartedly to the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is comfort, there is assurance here as he says there, verse 5, but take heart. This is our second last truth here, but take heart. And he tells us here's why, verse 5. But they will give account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. Now, Peter's writing this to Christians. He's not looking at non-Christians and saying, you're going to give account. He's not saying that to them. He's speaking to Christians and he's saying, hey, take heart. You know what? If they insult you, if they mock you, whatever they say about you, if they persecute you, just remember, your persecutors do not have the last word. They too will stand before the God that you and I will stand before. And they'll have to give an account for whether or not they followed Jesus Christ themselves. And he goes on and he says, For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that judged that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. What's going on there? You know, to be honest, you can read that and you can get really out of whack and get all confused and think that he's talking about something that isn't happening right here. Really, I think what Peter's trying to get at here is Peter's writing to uh, Christians who were being persecuted. And um, let me just say this. First off, persecution was not state-sanctioned yet. It's like us in America. It's not state-sanctioned to persecute Christians. That being said, though, 30 years from this, John wrote Revelation, and they were beheading people in Asia Minor. They were killing Christians there. All right, so let's not get too comfortable in America. In 30 years, they might be killing Christians here. You know, that'd be my children and grandchildren. Um, so just know this, this is the kind of world that we're in. It's a, it's a world that isn't a friend to Jesus. You just look around uh, India, North Korea. You, you go around to all these different countries, and it's starting to begin to happen in uh, Europe right now where there is just intense persecution of Christians. All that to say, there are some who trusted in Christ, and then they died, and the, the non-believers are able to look at that and say, see, look at that. They follow Jesus. They died just like everybody else. What's the point? It's not like they got zapped up to heaven or anything. I mean, they're dying just like everybody else. So, and Peter says, hey, you know what? The gospel was preached to them so that when they die, they live in the spirit. So that when they die, there's something that happens after that. And that is that they are alive forevermore the way God does. He told us that Jesus, back in chapter 3, verse 18, suffered once for sins are righteous for the unrighteous that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit he says that's what the gospel came to you for so that you would join this humanity of Jesus you'd follow him that you would have life not only fullness of life fullness of joy as Jesus said in this life but then when you die you'll be forever in his presence so our persecutors don't have the last word death does not have the last word who has the last word it ends with God. 
God has the last word. God ultimately will have the last word. So take heart. When you get real and you want to follow Jesus, you're not going to be brash about it. You're not going to be cruel about it or harsh. But you just want to reach people for Jesus. You want to show them what God has done in your heart. And you want to bring them to know him. And you, you face that opposition. Peter wants to remind you. Take heart. God's going to have the last word. And if Jesus Christ went to that cross and suffered for you, you better believe that he is going to see you through this. He is going to bring you through to the other side, and it will be well worth any sort of opposition you have to face. So I don't know if you're here this morning and maybe you've, you've been straddling the fence, so to speak. Say, I'm a Christian, I'm sold out for Christ, but I don't want to be that open about my faith. I, I, I kind of tone it down. I don't talk about it very much. Well, here's the thing. The reason why you're not being persecuted is because of that. When, when Paul wrote in Galatians, he said, if I, wanted to be, if I wanted the world to be friends with me, he said, then why would I be preaching the gospel? If I'm around preaching the gospel, I'm going to make enemies. The point is, I don't live for the world anymore. I live, ironically, I don't live for the world, but I actually live for the world, if that makes sense. I live for the good of the world, that the world might come to my Savior. So I'm actually living for their good, even as they don't understand it. And they're persecuting and insulting me. So we ought to be reminded of that as well. What you're doing in following Jesus and trying to reach others, don't believe what the world is trying to say that you're doing. Believe what you know from God's Word, what you are doing. That is, you're helping the world. You're trying to get them to to know true forgiveness, true freedom, true life. It's found in Christ. You ever seen somebody who's been made whole? And just how peaceful they are. They've wandered in sin for so long, and all of a sudden they have been liberated by God's grace. That's what we're, do we're doing. That's what we're living for. But those kind of people that get liberated, they, they are in need of liberation which means they are currently enslaved to Satan. Uh, your loved ones, your family members, your friends that don't know Christ. John says in 1 John, they are under the power of the evil one. They are deceived by, uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, by the little g God of this world, the ruler of this world. They are blinded. And Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, we ought to pray that they might be released from their bondage from, to Satan and that their eyes might be opened. And how is that going to happen? It's going to happen as we boldly stand out and we say, can I tell you about my Savior? And yes, they might ridicule. Yes, they might insult. But you know what we're doing? We're saving that person. We're, we're engaging in a battle for that person's soul just as somebody else did with us. And if you've ever had the privilege of seeing somebody else come to know Jesus Christ, it is worth the fight, isn't it? And we don't fight them. We fight Satan. And we're here for their good, to bring them to know true life and true forgiveness and all of that. But the one who has the final say isn't persecution. It isn't death. It isn't anything that this world throws at us. It's God and his grace. We know who wins in the end. We know who gets the victory. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know along the way, if we follow him, we're going to be insulted, yes. But those that we seek to reach, God will use us in our words to bring them out of that bondage and set them free so that they too can be a part of this family of God. So are you actively engaged in the battle? Or have you been sitting on the sidelines hoping somebody else will go out into the fray and do the work that you know you should be doing. Let's not sit on the sidelines and wait for somebody else to go and reach our loved ones, our neighbors and family and friends. Let's go share with them the hope of Christ. And let's embrace the hardship of trying to save somebody who's enslaved to a superpower, and that's Satan. Let's embrace the hardship of that person's probably going to fight back when we're trying to do the saving, when we're loving and praying for them and we're reaching with them. But let's remember it's worth it. It's worth it in the end. Because what they have to say is not going to be the ultimate thing. It's going to be what God has to say in the end. So 
Take heart. Take comfort. This life will soon be over. We'll all be with Jesus for all of eternity. And I'm looking forward to that day. But I don't want to get there and look back on this life and say, man, I wish I would have been more sold out. That'd be too late. While I'm here, while we're all here, let's commit. I'm going to be 100% for God. I'm going to live for Him and not for that old life of sin, not for this world and what they think, but I'm going to live for God no matter what because He's worth it. Let me pray for us. Lord, we just confess to you, God, that we don't live that way. Lord, we don't live for you and for your will. Um, in our flesh, God, we we just get too caught up with our own comfortable life, with, with our own busy schedules, and we get too caught up with what people might think of us, Lord. If they found out that we were really serious about Jesus and really loved them and wanted them to know Jesus, then they might, they might not like us. They might not be friends with us. Lord, help us to to remember that that life of trying to please other people, of trying to enjoy the comforts of whatever those little comforts are, that that life, we've lived enough time in that, and it's time to be done with that. Lord, help us to turn from that old life and to follow the one who was crucified and mocked because we know that he's the one who truly changes people. He's the one who saves. He even died for those that he came to save. I thank you so much, Lord, that even in my sin, that there was Christ suffering for my sins and for me, that I might know that liberation and that forgiveness. Help us to look around us. Help us to see those who are enslaved by the devil. Help us, God, to look into their eyes and see a captive soul who is in need of rescue. And help us to not be holier than thou, better than them, but, but to look at them with that pity that knows I was that way and I've been saved. And we would reach out to them. And God, that we would be able to see them brought to the other side, brought to faith in Jesus. And Father, if there's any this morning who they are living for the flesh, they're living for Satan, they're living for the world, and they need you, I pray God that today would be that day of salvation. They give their heart and life to you. May you bless us all as we respond accordingly in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you need to come front and uh, forward when we pray or sing this last song, then you can. If you need to come and pray for yourself or maybe there's some loved ones on your mind but you haven't been stepping out in faith and talking to them about Jesus you can come forward and you can you can pray and um, if you need to talk to somebody I would love to talk with you um, I'll be available after our service some of our Sunday school teachers are here as so well they'd be more than happy to talk with you if you have any questions all right if you'll please stand turn 565 565 we're going to sing the first